<clears throat> I hope you had a nice lunch, nutritious, delicious, <laughs> warm, hopefully. That's right. Somebody's just mentioned in the chat to me privately that um, they read during the break uh, in Bhikkhu Bodhi's book. I'm not sure which one, but it will be a translation of the Terigata, I think, that there was a Venerable Chanda in the Buddha's day and she wrote a verse in honor of Venerable Patachara. And that's very true. Um, Patachara was actually the teacher of Venerable Chanda in the Buddha's day. Um, um, Padachara, as I said, had a lot of bhikkhuni disciples and at least 500 women were enlightened under her. And uh, Venerable Chanda was a, a lady, I think she went forth in later life and, or at least a good way through her life. Um, and she was very poor and had had quite a difficult life and was wandering around like a recluse, but not as a nun yet. Um, kind of trying to seek the truth, but not knowing where to look. And she came across the Venerable Padachara and uh, gained great confidence in her. And as a result, she um, became the disciple of Venerable Patachara and also became enlightened. So there you go. Maybe it's uh, a good sign that I'm named after her and that now we have Venerable Patachara's uh, statue here to inspire. Certainly she has a lot of serenity and she's overcome a lot more suffering than me. So <laughs> yeah. It's really great to have this heritage, you know, from the Bhikkhuni Sangha, to have it preserved in the Terigata. And there's various translations of that. I was saying to River earlier, because she was wondering whether to read out some of those poems, that there are different translations and some are more poetically licensed. Uh, and others are closer to the actual words that those Bhikkhuni spoke. So different things speak to different people. But um, I really suggest uh, checking it out. If you can go to maybe Sutta Central, and there's a few translations on there, different translations of the Terigata. And these are the verses of the enlightened nun. But um, they, they basically, it's like, they give sort of inspired utterances after their awakening and they tell their story about, you know, what led to that and the struggles they went through before. So there were some bhikkhunis who were prostitutes before. There were some who were like um, princesses or, you know, people from a very high caste family. Um, there were people that went for, forth in their youth and others who went forth in later life. So it's really nice to see so many people represented there and uh, from the different castes as well. So, I mean, India still has a, a huge, um, I would say problem with the caste system in the sense that, you know, it shouldn't be used to devalue or elevate any, any human being on the basis of birth or skin color but unfortunately it is. But um, in those days, the Buddha made it clear that one can only become noble through one's uh, cultivation of their heart, not through their birth, you know, and that a true Brahmin, which is uh, someone from the highest caste, is someone who's purified their, their mind from all the defilements. So many people did that of all types of background. And I think, you know, similarly, we can do that today. Good. So this afternoon, I want to talk about loving kindness again. Really, we've been talking about loving kindness for the whole three days because all these qualities are so interrelated. But um, somebody mentioned yesterday, you know, that is there a place for actually cultivating and developing certain qualities, not only um, through the way we observe, through the way we relate, but as developments of the mind. And of course, the answer is yes. It's um, this, I guess, third and fourth of the right efforts to maintain the uh, wholesome states that have arisen and to actually increase them, to bring them to fulfillment. And I believe that by bringing, you can't really ever bring metta to fulfillment in the sense that you can never have too much, right? So it's something that we really can pursue to quite a great extent. And um, the great teachers in the world, you know, certainly the ones that I've known, um, I would say are characterized by the power of their loving kindness, by the unconditionality of that. 
the kind of love that really asks nothing in return. It's just truly amazing to meet people like this who just give, who just love for the sake of loving, you know, wanting nothing back from you at all, except of course, they hope for your happiness. But even if you're not happy, after years of them teaching you, they don't get upset, they don't get impatient or complain. <laughs> so it's really amazing. So metta, loving kindness, is one of what we call the Brahma Viharas. The others are compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity. And the word Brahma is like, um, in this case, like a divine abiding. The word Vihara means abode, like a dwelling place for the mind. And I wanted to read out a little quote by um, Thich Nhat Hanh. He's not really someone I consider one of my teachers in the sense that I don't um, read his stuff a lot, but sometimes I just come across these quotes and they're so beautifully expressed. <clears throat> For anyone who's not aware of who he is, he's a great Zen master, I'm very elderly now, I think about 94 or so, and may not be alive for that much longer. He um, was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King, actually. So great monk and um, an engaged Buddhist. So he says, your true home is something you have to create for yourself. When we know how to make peace with our body, take care of and release tension in our body, then our body becomes comfortable, a comfortable, peaceful home for us to come back to in the present moment. When we know how to take care of our feelings, how to generate joy and happiness and handle a painful feeling, we can cultivate and restore a happy home in the present moment. And when we know how to, mm, I've made notes here, how to generate energies of understanding and compassion, our home will become very cozy and a pleasant place to come back to. Home is not something to hope for, but something to cultivate. So this is the beauty of the mind because it's malleable, because it is uh, constantly changing. We have um, the possibility of influencing it and creating the kind of place within ourselves, the kind of inner home that we actually feel um, can be a peaceful abiding, can be a Brahma Vihara for us to come back to again and again. And also with this um, cultivation of metta as a quality, I find that it starts to seep into the rest of my life as well and actually reinforce the right intentions. So on the one hand, you can infuse your awareness with metta and use metta as a way of relating. But also when you cultivate metta intentionally, that has a feedback, feeds back into your intention. You find that everything you do seems to be um, more readily coming from a place of metta. And as I said, during my Rains retreat this year, it was actually a summer retreat in English, uh, in the English climate zone. Um, I noticed that I was developing quite a lot of metta and that was translating into a much softer, more forgiving inner dialogue with myself. And maybe other people have noticed this too, but I find that when I'm kind of a bit on edge or feeling a bit rushed, I tend not to take care of my surroundings as well. Like the house gets a bit messy and things get a bit neglected. Whereas when I'm like in touch with myself and I've got a lot of metta, I tend to just go that bit further to really take care of myself and my environment. So it's very nice to sort of notice how much space it gives you for that and how, you know, taking care of the heart translates into taking care of everything around you and the people around you as well. I also feel that metta can be fueled in a way like enriched and even caused by gratitude. And gratitude is another beautiful quality, you know, that's really encouraged by the Buddha to develop in our heart. And, uh, you know, having been alone for the last 10 months now in Oxford, hoping that I'd have a thriving little community by now, even if only small, um, I didn't have anyone here. And so there has been one lady in the local area, the same one who goes cold swimming, and she brings me some food at least once a week. And now there's another Sri Lankan lady who comes on a Saturday and she brings some lovely Sri Lankan food. But apart from that, um, I manage by cooking for myself. So I use that loophole in the Vinaya that says in times of danger and difficulty and famine, um, I permit you to cook. 
But the nice thing is I've still been able to live on the generosity of others. We haven't used a single penny from our bank accounts, you know, from the charity's funds. Um, we've basically invited people to offer groceries every week. And, um, and that's been successful and has brought in more people than ever before, I'd say, people who've never actually offered to the monastic Sangha. And, um, and they've really enjoyed being part of that and feeling that they can contribute. And uh, during my retreat, you know, receiving this food every week was so moving for me, even though I knew it was coming on a Tuesday evening, you know, I knew to expect the doorbell, but every time it manifested, I didn't just see food, I saw all these loving intentions, you know, people who didn't have to give, people who chose to do that, really expecting nothing in return other than the joy in their hearts when they contributed. Because I wasn't online to say thank you, you know, I wasn't sending emails for three months. So there was no obvious um, reward or, or like anything that they expected in return. But it, I mean, the reason it made me happy wasn't just that I was getting fed, it was that people are starting to understand what generosity feels like and what an important part it is in the path. And of course, the gratitude that I felt um, really helped in, me in my meditation because I had a, an uplifted and joyful heart. And, you know, when you are kind of being supported by other people, there's a certain responsibility that comes with that. Um, and you can easily turn it into a guilt trip if you want to, you know, <laughs> if you don't have enough meta for yourself, like, oh, who am I to be receiving all this? And at one point I did have that thought, but then I thought, no, that's not the point. It's just a possibility for more goodness to be generated in the world. And if it can inspire me to, to let go that little bit more, you know, to kind of um, rejoice in the goodness and rejoice in the fact that there are people who really value the practice and, um, are happy to support someone else's practice too. Because not all of us get the chance that I was getting for three months. But in this way, I felt that other people could participate and benefit from, from that as well. Almost as though I was meditating not only for myself, but for all those people who were supporting me. So this was very beautiful as an ongoing perception. And it also meant that I never felt alone. You know, I never actually felt lonely. And I think that would have been very different if I would have been, I mean, maybe not as a lay person necessarily, but as a lay person, you would be much more in control of having things the way you wanted and you would be probably doing it more through your own efforts. Whereas I was really having to surrender to whether or not I would be fed, right? So it was a group effort, a community effort. And I feel it's a really great sign that we are at the stage in the project where such a thing can actually be possible. So that's just an example of how gratitude can uh, help to generate metta, loving kindness. And of course, looking upon other people with gratitude, you know, looking upon their qualities, noticing the beauty in their hearts, even if it's not always visible, but you can always remember something, some attribute of that person, which is good, which is noble, which is pure, yeah. Or at least which tries its best, yeah. And if we look at that, then that part in that person tends to grow. And we also train our mind to develop wholesome qualities and not to get into this horrible fault finding and bickering and, you know, tearing people down. That includes ourselves, of course, right? Because sometimes it's hardest to have loving kindness for ourselves, And we expect much more from ourselves than we would ever expect from another person. Almost as though we have to be perfect which is just crazy because what is perfection anyway? Even enlightened people, they have their quirks, they have their stupid jokes and, you know, sometimes even kind of gender stereotypical jokes, which they get a bit of a look from me for. <laughs> but that's just the way people are conditioned. It's not actually necessarily, um, in this case, <laughs> no names mentioned, in this case, it's not a sign of any sort of impurity there because... Uh, there's just pure loving kindness. This might seem a bit off topic, but <laughs> I got this beautiful book for Christmas from my sister. I asked for it, actually. Oh, does anyone know this book? I just think this is pure Dhamma. And I don't often have books that are not official Dhamma books, but this is pure Dhamma, it really is. And I would really advise anyone to buy this. 
The Boy, the Mole, the Fox and the Horse by Charles McAvee. And I just wanted to read out one of these pages because there's only like a, a small amount of writing on each page in calligraphy, surprise, surprise, just like we were speaking about earlier. So it's like beautiful pictures, very simple and beautiful words. And uh, this relates to loving kindness for ourselves. How oh, other people had it? Great. So the little boy is saying to his friend, the mole, he says, sometimes I worry that you'll all realize that I'm ordinary, said the boy. Love doesn't need you to be extraordinary, said the mole. <laughs> it's just so gorgeous. Yeah, you really need to sit with this book and read sort of a little bit at a time but I found it really touched my heart and there's lots more in there. But anyway, just realizing that we are good enough and that we deserve our own loving kindness as well, the way we, that other people deserve it, right? Nobody wants to be hurt or harmed. So metta, what is it? <laughs> and uh, as one of the Brahma Viharas, it's actually known as a quality which is protective. They're known as the four protections. So metta protects. And um, the simile used in the Metta Sutta is that even as a mother protects with her life her only child, so we should develop um, a boundless heart, boundless loving kindness to all beings. And this draws on not only the kind of unconditional aspect of love, but also the impartiality of loving kindness. Because it's not saying that a mother's love is loving kindness. It's saying that even as a mother protects with her life, her child. So we should develop the same um, loving kindness to all beings. And that's what makes the difference. So it, it isn't only to me and mine, it's to all beings as though all beings were our child. Yeah, so it's starting to dissolve the boundaries. It's called Sima Sambeda. Metta dissolves boundaries between self and other, between the ones we like and the ones we don't, the ones who have the same political views, the ones who have different political views, the ones of the same color or a different color, yeah, same gender or a different gender. It's starting to dissolve those boundaries because it's looking at the universality of human experience. It's looking at the fact that we're all um, going to age, we're all going to get sick and we're going to die. We're brothers and sisters in birth, old age, sickness and death, yeah? And, you know, in that sense, it can be a real equalizer and help to um, um, undermine prejudice and bias and anything that marginalizes others. Another way I like to think of it is like um, widening the circle of what's acceptable to us, yeah? So we can widen the circle to include um, different emotions, different feelings, parts of ourselves that we've maybe rejected or left out. We dissolve the boundary between the bits we're proud about and the bits we feel ashamed of. We stop stigmatizing certain aspects or patternings within ourselves because it's all conditioned. It's all, you can trace it back to something usually in this life and if not then perhaps in previous lives if that's the way you understand the world um, and as I say nothing is fixed you can see that in your own practice you can see that in your own life we have a possibility to change and to incline towards goodness increasingly so the more our mindfulness um, becomes strong and, and encompassing unconditional mindfulness if you like so you might know that my teacher um, ordained, well, he didn't ordain, but he took part in the first um, bhikkhuni ordination in the Thai Theravada tradition in Perth in 2009. Actually, bhikkhunis are always ordained by other bhikkhunis. So they were the actual preceptors, but Ajahn Brahm and his um, Sangha of monks um, officiated that um, ordination. So they were involved. And um, because of that, he was kind of delisted. Some people like to say excommunicated, but that sounds like really serious. Like there's a Pope in charge of Buddha, all Buddhists. Um, basically what it means is that his monastery is no longer recognized as a branch. So what, <laughs> right? So what? anyway, it wasn't very pleasant. So, you know, I can see that a lot of people if they still had anger or hatred in their heart or insecurity or fear, 
or even if he would have wavered in his resolve and in his value system at that point, he could have backed out and said, okay, okay, I did the wrong thing. And he was actually asked to denounce the ordination and to say that those women were not bikinis after all. But of course he couldn't do that because that wouldn't be true. And he didn't let the fear overcome him. Anyway, he went back to Perth and um, there was a lot of, you know, silly stuff going on, political stuff. It happens in every aspect of life. Buddhists are not <laughs> immune from it either. Um, but he put this beautiful poem on his website and I just thought it was so wonderful. And it's by Edward Markham, Markham I think. And it says, um, they drew a circle to keep me out. Rebel, heretic, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took them in. <laughs> I just think that's so beautiful because Meta requires that we do keep on extending the boundaries of that circle, making the circumference wider and wider until it becomes boundless, apamana, the immeasurable mind of loving kindness. This is what the Buddha describes as Mahagata Chitta, the Chitta gone to greatness. It's boundless. It's almost encompasses the whole world. And sometimes when you're practicing metta, you might feel as though, you know, all sorts of beings want to come in and into that flow. They might just come to mind at that time and join in, partake of your abundant metta that you're feeling in that time. But even if you haven't experienced such exalted states of loving kindness or, you know, that expansive state of heart, the Buddha also said that even if you can have thoughts or emotions of pure loving kindness for the time it takes to pull a cow's udder. So this is in the days of dairy farming in India. Even for that time it takes to pull the cow's udder. If you have metta for that length of time, it is more beneficial than giving like alms food, doing charity to hundreds of people. It's more beneficial than that. And that sounds like kind of crazy, right? Because surely it's more important that metta manifests as wholesome action and you actually alleviate the suffering of other people. But when I thought about why that might be, I thought that's because if you're really coming from a place of metta, you're purifying your mind from the root. You're purifying the motivation of the mind. And if you're doing that, it's likely that all your actions of body, speech and mind are going to stem from that loving kindness. And so in the long run, there's much more possibility that you will not do only one act of charity, but many, many, many acts in all sorts of different ways. So we're purifying the mind at the root level here. And um, it gives great encouragement, doesn't it? To think that in that one moment, you know, you're practicing the Buddha's teachings, you're keeping the unwholesome states away just by keeping your friends at home, so to speak. Yeah, the enemies can't come in and take over the house. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't normally call like negative um, or afflictive emotions enemies, but in, just for the sake of the analogy, if you keep your mind full of these beautiful friends, the four Brahma Viharas, then other things don't really have a chance to come in. And if they come in, you'll perceive them as friends anyway. So you might not even know if your enemies have come <laughs> because your whole perception of that will change. So, and in the Buddhist Sutta this morning, I read out a little bit about um, how to cope with harsh speech, you know, harsh words when we receive the harsh words of others. And that was part of a sutta called the simile of the saw. And many of you might know that simile, but the next part in that simile following on from there sounds really extreme. And I wanted to just read it out just to make a point. And the point isn't that you should let yourself be chopped into pieces. Okay, it's not the point. <laughs> so the Buddha says, monastics, even if bandits were to sever you savagely, limb by limb with a two-handled saw, one who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. Here in monastics and lay people, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with them, we shall abide pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness. 
abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. So that's quite amazing. And I'm not sure if or to whom that might be possible. You know, if you're actually being tortured and tormented, although there are plenty of cases like that among um, Tibetan Buddhists who've been imprisoned, you know, in um, terrible conditions and have been tortured and they come out saying that they have no hate in their heart. So this isn't saying that we should just let ourselves be cut into little pieces. It's not uh, advocating passivity in that way. You try to stop people performing on wholesome acts as best you can and you encourage wholesome acts. But the point here is that um, if you allow hatred into your heart, you're actually not practicing loving kindness because loving kindness is the antidote to ill will and it's impossible for hate to enter if you have a mind of love. But the other reason I think that he makes this point is because even though in the most incredible of tortures, you're suffering intensely, it is almost like the effect of, it, it's something that's transitory that torment, that torture will pass. And if you don't make negative karma by reacting with hate, you know, you're actually in the long run, in a spiritual sense, that doesn't have to be an obstacle in your path. Whereas if you develop hate, then you are planting seeds for more hatred to arise in the future. Yeah, so it's really important to take care of the quality of our mind and hopefully avoid being in such a situation. <laughs> but just to point out the actual potential of this practice from the cow's udder all the way to, you know, being able to bear with um, unpleasant words and even abuse, even torture. Again, with abuse, I would definitely say if you're in an abusive situation and you can remove yourself from that and you have the support of others around you then please try to you know and sometimes it can take a long time to have the courage and the um, support to be able to do that so nobody's saying that because you're buddhist you know you ought to be able to like forgive i mean forgive is different but you shouldn't put up with anything that's harming you right because the buddha said um, loving kindness should go to all as to oneself so you're no different from anyone else. You don't deserve to be treated any worse than anyone else either. So to all is to oneself. And oneself is often the place we make compromises and we think, well, I don't really have to look after myself that well because nobody else is going to complain if I don't, right? So, but it's really important. So I wanted to talk, uh, as usual, I'm talking longer than I expect, ah, but let's skip some of the benefits then. But one of the benefits is that um, loving kindness helps you enter samadhi. It says one with a mind of loving kindness um, easily enters samadhi. And I think the main reason is, uh, there's a few reasons, but one reason is because it gives you such a sense of well-being and ease and the mind needs to be relaxed and calm and full of wellness, well-being to enter samadhi. The other reason is because um, it's a very happy and pleasant abiding. And samadhi's proximate cause, the proximate cause for stillness, which is usually translated as um, concentration, the proximate cause, and uh, you know, it also makes you wonder if concentration is the right word, is actually happiness. Sukhi no chitam samadhi Samadhi, stillness, or so-called concentration, arises from a happy mind, not from a tense or a tight mind or a mind that's full of ill will. So not from a mind that's going, come on, come on, get on with it, get into deeper meditation. That doesn't work. It comes from a happy mind. So again, that contentment, developing that inner contentment. And of course, the other reason is because um, in order to enter the deep meditations, we have to overcome the hindrances. And ill will is really at the root of most of those hindrances. Ill will and craving are just really two sides of the same coin. And uh, other things like restlessness, doubt, uh, tiredness it comes it's sort of based on ill will and sort of negativity of the mind not wanting to be where you are or you know kind of being confused being a bit uh, restless not wanting to stay with what's in front of you so these are all ways that loving kindness can help you in the samadhi practice and I often practice by beginning my session with metta and actually practicing quite a lot of metta to actually generate feelings of happiness and ease. And then when that's already there, then sometimes I turn to the breath. 
So I'll give you that opportunity in the guided meditation. I'll start you off with some metta, but then, you know, it'll be up to you whether you want to continue practicing metta or whether you want to just take that quality of metta into whatever you're aware of next, whether that's a more broad and expansive awareness or whether that's, you know, um, more um, directed to a particular object like the breath or the body sensations. Yeah, there's all kinds of different ways to practice. So see how you feel about that. But I wanted to also say that um, metta can lead to insight as well. Metta is not only a feel-good practice or a samadhi practice. Metta is also a, a practice that engenders a lot of wisdom. And there are various ways that this is discussed in the suttas. The main way, of course, is that samadhi does help us to see things as they really are, because again, those hindrances are not distorting the truth. And um, the mind is soft. The Buddha says, you know, when you've purified it from the hindrances, the mind is malleable, soft and fit for work, which means you can actually direct it into any area of experience that you wish. And the analogy he makes is like um, melting gold. So the gold at first is full of these impurities, the five hindrances, other types of metal, lead, tin, copper, whatever. So you melt down that gold and, and remove the impurities. And at that point, when the gold is molten, the gold is soft, you can make any, anything you want out of that gold. So in the suttas, it says, you know, at this point, you can direct the mind towards impermanence, suffering and non-self. You might choose to direct your mind towards past lives, and I know plenty of people who've done that. So this is something real. Um, there's also the possibility to direct the mind towards um, beings arising and passing and notice that beings come into existence and pass away due to causes. So we're getting insight here into the Four Noble Truths, yeah, into causality, dependent arising. So this is obviously a very high stage of practice and I can't claim to be doing those things myself or not doing some of those things anyway. Um, but there are other reasons that uh, metta can lead to wisdom. And one is that we learn that letting go leads to joy. And the more we can let go, the more we can get out of the way, the more joy starts to arise because metta is a less conditioned state than the states of aversion and clinging. The states of aversion and clinging always revolve around someone wanting something or not wanting something. So they tend to be um, very solidified states where there's a very strong sense of self involved. I want, I don't want. But when those hindrances start to be overcome, then the sense of self starts to dissolve. You're not so solid anymore and people can come and say things to you that might normally upset you and you just shrug and say yeah never mind or you can even laugh and say that's true yes I do have that tendency you know and that's okay <laughs> if you're really at ease with yourself that's okay you can admit it as well so letting go leads to joy and metta is less fabricated and then after spreading metta in one sutta, and I haven't written down here the, the uh, exact place it's mentioned, but in one sutta, in the Majjhima Nikaya, I think the Buddha actually says that the best thing to do is to then contemplate the five khandhas as suffering, affliction, alien. That's the aspect of not mine, right? They're alien. They're disintegrating, again, related to impermanence. They're empty and non-self. And I think this is really important to note the order there. So it's after spreading the metta, you can do that. So your mind is already resourced. It's already um, at ease. If you like, there's some cushioning there in the mind. Yeah, so that you're not gonna be broken apart by these realizations. If anything, it's gonna lead to further letting go and peace and ease. And then the last thing that I found in the suttas where the Buddha talks about insight arising through metta is that you are able to see even the states of metta as conditioned, as conditioned and volitionally produced. So although they're less conditioned than states of um, suffering, aversion, you know, states where the five hindrances are involved, they still are in this conditioned realm. They're still abiding, they're still planes of existence. And he says that at that time, you know, um, we can reflect that they're volitionary produced and therefore it's not the end of the path yet. There's yet something more to be 
discovered. Yeah. So in Buddhism, we're always digging deeper, digging deeper, digging deeper all the time. So I wanted to practice some metta with you and um, just go over very briefly how it's normally done. Um, generally speaking, we start metta practice uh, using thought, using like a discursive method. So we choose some phrases that resonate for us, which um, capture our well-wishing towards ourselves or another person. So, I mean, I could offer you some or you could find some out for yourself. Um, usually I say to myself, I usually choose positive words rather than free from suffering or free from fear because all words have an, an energy somehow. And I just think the mind knows if you say a word content or happy, it just tends to, for me anyway, incline my mind in a slightly more wholesome way. So I usually say, may I be happy? May I be free? That implies from suffering or whatever. May I be healed? I guess because to me that's mental and physical. And may I be at peace? And I just like the sound of those words because they rhyme <laughs> as well. So, and it's become quite a, not like a mantra, but something that my mind instantly recognizes now as, oh, now she's practicing metta. And so it's nice when you have something that works for you and you can sort of bring it up and your mind makes that association. It can be a slightly quicker way in. So you don't have to have four, but it's up to you. You might just want, may I be happy? May I be peaceful? May I be liberated or, or something? One teacher that I know, Ajahn Sajato, he just uses, may I be happy? That's just all he uses. May I be happy? May I be happy? And he's been using that for like 30 odd years. <laughs> That's his main practice, actually. And uh, so it starts in that discursive way. But the point is not the words. The point is where the words are pointing to. It's the meaning behind those words. So we make pause in between each phrase and we just allow the meaning or allow the vibration, if you like, of those words to, to resonate. And it's almost like inviting the mind to follow in that direction, not intentionally, but just wait and see, you know, just listen in to your heart. How does that feel? So you're keeping connected to your body and then you put in the next phrase, listen, put in the next phrase. So you're engaging with the phrases. It's not happening automatically. You're not becoming disconnected from the meaning of those words. Yeah, so you're staying embodied. And what you might notice is that over time, if the mind starts to calm down, you might need to say these phrases less often. There might be bigger gaps between the phrases, or even you might move towards just a single word or a single phrase. You don't have to. If it works for you by just carrying on repeating all those phrases, it's absolutely fine. But if it starts to feel like too much, too much effort, too much talking within, just drop it down a bit or keep more silence in between. And also I find the other elements. So there's the element of the words. There's the aspect of the feeling in your heart or in your body. Anything that feels, just keep, keep your mind aware of that for whatever arises. And then the other aspect is the person who you're generating loving kindness towards. So if it's yourself, it's sometimes harder to visualize yourself and you don't really need to, but you can sort of inwardly smile at yourself. If it's another person, and I want to practice with the loved person today, um, then we bring up their face or a sense of their energy in front of us or around us. It depends if you're visual. Some people are very visual. You can easily see a person's face and you don't have to hold all the features really clearly in mind, but just to have a sense that that person is the object of your metta. Um, and if you can't visualize very easily, just bring to mind that person's presence, how you feel around that person, like a general sense of who they are. And so you're repeating these phrases, you're connected to your body, and you're also seeing or feeling that person. So you can use their name, like may Alison be happy, may Alison be free, or whoever it is. Alison's my best friend, by the way. <laughs> but it was just a, a random name that came straight away. Um, and, and just actually imagining them receiving it, you know, treat it like a real thing that's happening between you both. 
because it is incredible how these qualities of loving kindness can spread beyond um, what we understand as this physical world that we can experience right now with our senses. Yeah, metta actually has a powerful effect. And sometimes I've felt it when my teachers, also my first teacher, my goodness, my preceptor in Burma had such powerful metta. I used to know when he was sending me metta, it had a certain quality to it that I became very familiar with. And it was very clearly his metta. And that was tested out by my fellow nun at the time because he was away once in the from the monastery. And we were both sitting like incredibly long hours in those days. We'd sit for sort of four or five hours at a stretch. And then we'd come out of the meditation and we both said to each other, about halfway through that, did you feel something? We're like, yeah, I felt metta, like Sayadaw's metta. And she said, yeah, I think he came back that time. We said, yeah, I think he did. And of course he did, you know. <laughs> so it's incredible. It's really powerful. Um, so, but anyway, step by step. Okay, so shall we practice some metta for half an hour or so? And if it doesn't work for you at this time, please don't worry, just relax the words, relax any effort whatsoever, and just go back to making peace with whatever arises in your body and mind, yeah? Sometimes the opposite of metta can arise because we come in contact with the blockages to metta. We come in contact with our irritation, our frustration, even our anger towards a person so if that happens don't worry just turn your meta towards the anger towards the frustration towards yourself okay remember we're widening the boundary of what's okay what what we can let in let's have a little stretch a little wiggle Sometimes you can rub yourself too. Oh, someone else is doing it. Yeah, sometimes I just kind of give my neck a bit of a rub. Or, you know, I notice some of you are giving your head a little rub. Maybe the temples if you feel sleepy. The Buddha used to pull his ears if he felt sleepy. I'm not sure it works, but. <laughs> Good. Just taking that bit of care to contact your body can be really helpful. Not forgetting that we have a body. Hmm. Right now, the sun's shining in where I am. And it reminds me of the qualities of loving kindness and mindfulness. So just spreading my awareness through the body as though bathing in the golden sunlight. Honoring my body sitting Sensing into the shape. The weight. The textures. Maybe the temperature of your body. Showing your body the friendly presence of your mind. Your mind's not going to be pushing your body around or demanding anything of it. For the next half hour or so. So allow your body to find its own comfort. Show your body that you care.
And I'd like to start by inviting you to just do a little bit of Chaganu Sati. Earlier we talked about generosity. And this is reflecting on one's own goodness, one's own virtue, one's own generosity. So I'd like to invite you to bring some quality to mind that you recognize and value in your own heart. Or maybe it could be something you've done that you feel happy about. It doesn't have to be anything incredible, anything special. But something you can really appreciate and respect. Or some quality that you respect in yourself. Bring it to mind. And see if you can allow your mind to rejoice in that quality. Or in that thing that you've done. The way you've served or cared for another. Sensing any uplift that brings to the body, the mind. Just enjoying, valuing, respecting, rejoicing in goodness. And if you wish, you can offer yourself the phrases of loving kindness that you've chosen. Repeating them calmly, clearly, rhythmically. As though planting a seed in the soil of your heart with great care and attention. listening in the space between each phrase. Staying connected to your body.
not looking for anything special to arise, but just trusting in the power of these intentions of loving kindness to slowly incline the mind in the direction of the beautiful. If you wish, you can continue to send loving kindness to yourself if it's nourishing, if it feels like what you need. Otherwise, staying connected to yourself, to your own energetic field. Just gently invite someone who is dear to you with whom you have quite a beautiful but straightforward relationship with. It could be a teacher, a guardian, a sibling or a best friend. It could be a child, a niece or a nephew. See if there's someone who brings a smile to your face just to recollect them. And who naturally engenders that sense of goodwill. See if you can sense their presence or even imagine their face as though they were seated in front of you. You were looking into their eyes, they're looking into yours. Staying connected to your heart. Gently offering them the phrases of loving kindness. Staying relaxed, just simply planting the seeds and allowing them their own time and space to grow under the kind awareness, the light and warmth of the sun that just listens to the space between the phrases. nourishing the seeds. Just enjoying this beautiful act of giving, keeping the effort relaxed.
Imagining this person relaxing, feeling increasingly at ease. As you suffuse them in thoughts, good wishes of loving kindness. you want to stay with this perception and carry on or choose another person, please do. You may wish to simply allow your experience to unfold naturally, keeping the mind of loving kindness. Maybe noticing the breath. As though the breath becomes the object of your loving kindness. Or maybe the whole body or any experience that arises. Just comes into this field of loving kindness, loving awareness. As the mind becomes quiet, Returning to the phrases any time you need that extra boost.
So coming close to the end of the meditation. Just notice again how you're feeling. Coming in contact with any sensations in your body. And if you are still sending metta to your loved person, just gently bidding them farewell. Noticing any pleasant sensations in your body, in your heart. Taking the opportunity to thank yourself for your practice. Smiling into your heart. Just taking another couple of minutes to wish yourself well again. If you wish, you may want to place a hand on your heart as a physical expression of loving kindness and care towards yourself. As you wish yourself well. Staying connected with that warmth within and in your own time, gently, slowly opening your eyes. I've got a big smile on my face because I had to repeat that last part twice. I <laughs> forgot that I had muted myself, so I'd already said those things once. So <laughs> you got a few more moments. It's kind of nice because in the past I would have thought, oh, you idiot. But actually, I thought it was quite amusing. <laughs> so on the recording, I'll be just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> very good <laughs> all right gosh it's tempting to say we're coming close to the end but that's not really true because we're still here so we still have a lot of time to practice a lot of moments always this moment but lots of this moment to come. So now it's time for a change of posture. So if you wish, I will invite you to do some walking meditation again. I didn't mention earlier, but if you wish, you could also do some standing meditation. That's also another posture you can use if you don't feel like uh, walking. Normally I'd suggest keeping your eyes 
downcast but slightly open so you are balanced and usually if people aren't used to standing for some time then five or ten minutes might be as much as feels comfortable for you so you can just gently bend your knees and allow your body to kind of feel very grounded very rooted to the earth and just stand nice and loosely if you wish <laughs> so now see you back here at three and at three we'll just sit quietly for 20 minutes okay before we have our next bit so see you in 15 minutes or so